today we're going to take a look at the question, can we know the time of Christ's coming? As some are asking this question, I would like to give some biblical principles uh, so we can see if or what the Bible says and what the Bible teaches on this matter. So we will briefly today look at some guidelines. In Matthew 24, Jesus is giving uh, the signs right before he's coming back. And in this chapter with a lot of signs in the midst of there, uh, Jesus says at least three times, uh, but the day and hour knoweth no man. In verse 36, Know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And then he says, Be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. And then in chapter 25 or 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Sadly, in spite of all this, Christians... Uh, Christian after Christian have been setting a time for Christ's coming and it has failed over and over again. Jesus warned this, and not only once or twice, but three or even more times through this chapter, through this passage in the Bible. Because he knew that this was going to take place, but the warning is still there. Now, what does the word day and hour mean in Greek? Obviously, it means literally what it says, day and the hour, but also this word could be taken in a figura figuratively uh, way, uh, meaning a period or age, um, time, and even years. So, uh, and the word, the word, this is the, day for, uh, the word for day. Uh, the word for hour uh, could also mean season or time. So, we could apply it to the seasons of the year. Um, uh, Ellen White, she made this statement in the View and Herald, November 27th, uh, in the year 1900. She says, God gives no man a message that it will be five years, or ten years, or twenty years, before this earth's history shall close. You know, it's pretty clear that here... Uh, God's prophet is is referring to you know the word of God, and she says she's even using the term year uh, that that this will never be a message from God coming that we would even know uh, the year. In fact, uh, a less known passage in Acts chapter one verse seven. It's it's quite an interesting context here because Jesus had just told the disciples. Uh, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And the disciples then ask him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So, just as the disciples wanted to know when is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they also wanted to know, know uh, when is your coming. And, and Christ's answer in Acts chapter 1 verse 7 is this. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The same as he said in Matthew 24, only the Father knows this. So now it's extending even in the literal language to times and seasons. This is not for us to know. And in fact, and why she comments on this, and she has a whole sermon about this called, um, uh, it's not for you to know times and, and the seasons or something similar. And so she's talking about this and many interesting points in this, in this sermon. We don't have the time, unfortunately, to go through all of them, but she says, the times and seasons God has put in his own power. And why has not God given us this knowledge? Because we n would not make a right use of it if he did. A condition of things would result from this knowledge among our people that would greatly retard the work of God in preparing a people to stand in the great day that is to come. So in other words, we will not make good use of it if we were to know it. So this is why God has been withholding this from us. And she goes on to say, we are not to be engrossed with speculations in regard to the times and the seasons which God has not revealed. Jesus has told his disciples to watch, but not for definite time. They were to watch for the signs. She goes on to says, 
say his followers are to be in the position of those who are listening for the orders of their captain. They are to watch, wait, pray and work as they approach the time for the coming of the Lord. But no one, how many? No one will be able to predict just when that time will come. And then she quotes, for of that day or an hour knoweth no man. Okay, so here she's quoting this very passage. If we looked at the day and the hour, which figuratively can also mean time in general, seasons and even years. And then she goes on to, to, to apply it in this figuratively, figurative way and say, you will not be able to say that he will come in one, two or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by saying that it may not be for 10 or 20 years. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Friends, Jesus wants us to have a constant expectation of Christ coming, an attitude of waiting for his coming and be ready constantly. Now, another important point from Scripture is God will cut the last day short. In Matthew 24, verse 22, he says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Here he refers maybe more specifically to the 1260 days uh, that has been fulfilled, but I also think this applies to the very end. And, and you want to know why? In Romans chapter 9, it's even clearer that this is talking about the end. So uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 27 and 28 says, I say as also Christ concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So this is talking about the very end, right? And then it says in verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the short work will the Lord make upon the earth. So if God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the work short, in the very end, as I'm going to gather a remnant, I'm going to cut it short. Can we trust it or not? We can, friends. We can, we can trust God's word. Now, also, we can learn from Scripture, in, from Reve Revelation chapter 10, verse 6, that there is not going to be any more prophetic time after the, the last period that was fulfilled in 1844, the 2,300 days. Now, the, the, the verse says this, And swear by him, verse 6, that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, this is not referring to time in general. If, if you study this chapter, chapter 10, you will understand that this is talking about when a time of judgment started. That was in 1844. And in fact, uh, Ellen White, she comments on this text. And she makes this statement over and over again. She says here, for instance, in, in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 73, The Lord has been placed to show me. So when God's prophet says, God is showing me. Can we trust that or not? Friends, we can. She says, The Lord has been placed to show me that there would be no definite time in the message given of God since 1844. With other words, we cannot trace uh, any definite time in regards to prophecy. She continues to say in manuscript releases, I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. Aha, uh -huh, okay. And then in another statement, where actually this is the same, a few pages later, she says, she says this, Ever since 1844, I have borne my testimony that we are that we were now in a period of time in which we are to take heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they, that, so that they come upon us unawares. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene. What did you say? No time proclamation. To intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844. The close of prophetic periods in 1844. And the time of our Lord's coming. What are words? Nothing. We do not know the day nor the hour or when the definite time is. 
and yet the prophetic reckoning shows us that Christ is at the door. When Sister White talks about definite time, it also includes uh, the year. Uh, we see that if, if you look, if you study what she says about this, you will find that. In fact, we read this as, as the first quote here, the longer quote from the Review and Herald. She talked about definite time and then she mentioned also the years. So knowing the definite time of Christ's coming also include the years. So she says, we cannot know this. The Bible states so and she quotes, you know, when Christ says the day and the hour, because this is not only a literal meaning, it's a figurative way of speaking as the Greek implies also is possible. Now, something that's important to consider when a message is given, because you know, there are several so-called prophecies and new light out there. And now some people say, Christ will come back in 2022. Christ will come back in 2030. Christ will come back in 2031. You know, uh, all of these, they are pointing to Sister White. They are pointing to the Bible. This is what they are basing the belief upon. And friends, not all of these three can be correct. We know that. I mean, that's quite logical. Now, let's face it. Uh, we have already seen quite clearly that the Bible states we cannot know times and seasons, the day and the year. So what are we to know? When He is near. We have all the signs. Now, there are no prophecy in the Word of God, or perhaps at least we could say this is one of the few, that has so many signs connected to it, Christ's second coming. So, if this is true, why would God also give a time? Now, we need to ask some questions uh, when looking at such theories. Uh, you know, one important thing is to look at the fruits. The fruits of these people, the fruits of the teachings. And if you look at the fruits of the teachings of time proclamation in the past, all of them are bad. People are losing faith. Uh, people start doubting and, and leave the church and get so excited about this one prophecy that everything is centered around it. You know, and then a big disappointment and people just leave the faith and lose hope. Um, so we have to ask, is Christ in the center? Do these people have godly lives? Do they have Christ in the center of the sermons? Do they teach practical Christianity and so on? Now friends, with my own eyes and also some of my friends out there have been telling me uh, what they have been observing. So I've, so I've observed this myself and friends have been telling me that people that hold on to this theories um, and be even people that preach them, you know what the fruits are? They stop going to the church. They're criticizing the church, leading others to do the same. They put themselves you know, in the judgment seats, uh, proclaims that the church has fallen or, or it is about to fall. These are just some examples of the fruits. And some people are like, you know, why should I go to church? If Christ is not coming back in so and so many years, why should I go to church? And I would say also, good question. Why? If there is already a set date, if we could do nothing of this, I can just, I would rather spend my time doing something else. Why would I go to church? So these are some of the fruits. And these fruits were even warned by, by God's prophet would happen when we are doing this. So it's just, it should just prove that these things are right, what the Bible says and what the spirit of prophecy says. Now, another important point is uh, in the Word of God, it's talking about that we can hasten the Lord's coming. In 2 Peter, for instance, chapter 3, uh, it's talking there, you know, in, in, the, in, in verse 12, looking for an hastening unto, hastening unto the coming of the day of God. So, here in this context, it's talking about how the Lord will come as a thief in the night and so on. And it says, looking for and what? Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And you know what the word in Greek means? The word hastening. Speed. With other words, can we speed up Christ's coming? Yes, I believe so, because the Word of God says so. And it's talking about what manner of persons, verse 11, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know, the mystery of God will be revealed to the world in the very end. The glory of God, God's character is going to be revealed to the whole world. It's going to be filled with His glory. And we are going to take part in this important work. 
So if we're going to take part in this work, if we're going to finish this work, if God has called us to do this work, then of course the work will depend in how we cooperate with God. Because he has entrusted us with his work. That is a great privilege, but also a great responsibility. Um, and as the Spirit prophesies us in Christ's Obit Lessons, chapter 3, in the end there, from, from page 69, it says some very interesting things regarding these verses. And listen carefully. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting for longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be what? Perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quoting this very text. And then she says, where were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Wow, we can actually do something. And if we let God work in us, we one day, his church, as according to, to Bible prophecy, will be glorious, be perfect, be reflecting God's character. Now, we were given a free will. And that means that God's work needs human cooperation. Because he has been telling us that, you know, I'm entrusted you to do this work. So, humanity needs to cooperate with divinity for this last work to happen. And if that is the case, if we can hasten his coming, we can make his coming to be sooner. Then, then later, and praise the Lord for that. This is why I'm doing the work I'm doing. This is why I devote my life to God and doing His work, because I want to see Him coming. And I want as many as possible to be prepared for this day. And I hope this is uh, what you want to do as well. In Acts of the Apostles, page 111, it says, When the members of the Church of God do their appointed work in the needy fields, at home and abroad, in fulfillment of the Gospel Commission, the whole world will soon be warned and the Lord Jesus will return to this earth with power and great glory. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all the nations. And then shall the end come. This gospel. This is the last thing that will take place. All the gospel will go to the world. And if all the gospel will go to the world through us, we need a cooperation with, with, with God. That means something has to take place in us and God will not force us. We are not robots. We have been created with a free will. So God has chosen to use us and we can hasten his coming. So, and we also see this in, in Revelation 14, you know, it says there when, right before Jesus is coming, then it says, you know, now is the time because the harvest of the earth is ripe. The, the, the harvest, the earth needs time to be ripened before Christ can come. Another important point is, uh, you know, and why she speaks against, we have been always see, seeing that, but she, there are dozens upon dozens of quotes where she speaks about time setting again and again, and she's so perplexed because people don't listen to her. When will we learn from her history, friends? So, you know, she had a sermon about it, she wrote several articles about it, uh, she included a war warning in several different books, and a study, if you study, you will find that this was not only for her time, because she extended this warning to the end of time. And she talked in future tense so many times, you know, there will never again be a message based upon definite time. And um, she called it the work of Satan to, to set times, you know, again for Christ's coming. And she also said, as we saw, looked about the time setting, she includes the day, the hour, the times and seasons and years. We are not to know any of this. So only we're to know when the time is near. This is what we are to know. That's why we have so many signs. And we need to study, you know, in order to understand these things. I hope already have been seeing that this is quite clear, but I'm going to give you some more, uh, some more details, some more reasons. 
And as Elamai says, the testimonies themselves, in other words, her writings themselves, will be the key that will explain the messages given as, given as scripture is explained by scripture. We have to compare her writings, not say, okay, let's see, what does she mean here? And then make a fanciful human explanation, like some do. Uh, and this is how we get to these theories. If you let her writings explain themselves, just as scripture is to be explained by scripture, um, we will be safe. That's the only way we'll be, we will be safe. Because she warned this. She says, There will be those once united with us in the faith who will search for new strange doctrines, for something odd and sensational to present to the people. They will bring in all conceivable fallacies and will present them as coming from Mrs. White, that they may be beguiled souls. This is serious, friends. And people are using statements of her, you know, how the old earth is and so on. And that she made statements that were, you know, definite. The earth was exactly this old at this time. Using, for instance, the 4,000 years. Uh, when she talks about the 6,000 years, sometimes she says, now the earth has been standing for 6,000 years, about 6,000 years, nearly, or almost, or even one time at least, she says, more than 6,000 years. So, um... And in fact, in the same book, she says one, one time, four, six thousand years and nearly six thousand years. Now, regarding the four thousand years, I do believe that this earth is going to stand about six thousand years as, as if we studied the spirit prophecy. Um, but I, I also do believe that we are not to know the exact time as we've been looking at. And a good proof of that, and one particular quote that people are using to prove that they can know the exact year, is one statement from Ellen White. Uh, talking about the 4,000 years when Christ died upon the cross in, in AD 31. The only problem is she uses this expression of the 4,000 year at least three different places describing different times. For instance, when, when Jesus accepted humanity after sin had been in the world for 4,000 years. And then she says, until Christ was tempted in the wilderness, sin had been there for 4,000 years. When Christ died on the cross, as I said, and then also when Paul made a statement regarding the state of the dead. So it is easy to understand what she meant and what she did not mean when you let the testimonies be the key to understand her writings. As she said we are to do, not make fanciful explanations of a few quotes. Now another point is time prophecies don't have signs. Or if they do, very, very few, to, to give some more details uh, to the prophecy. Um, but this is an important one. Why did God give so many signs? If he at the end of time would lead people to, um, to give people a time prophecy uh, that gives the very year and the season of his coming. That doesn't make sense at all. And as I said, this, this has a lot of signs. Take, for instance, the 2300-day prophecy. This did not have any signs. But if you calculate the time from when the beginning, it gives details from the beginning, and, uh, and then we know when, they, when it starts and when it's going to end. But comparing with Christ's second coming, it has so many signs. This is the difference. So if you compare the prophecy of the second coming with the, his first coming, his first coming... There was no time prophecy reaching uh, to his first coming, but it was a lot of signs. And again, in the second coming, the prophecy for that has a lot of signs. And again, no time prophecy, no set time. And why she says in Desire of Ages, page 634, After he had given the signs of his coming, Christ said, When ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Take ye heed, watch and pray. So Christ's disciples were given warning of the destruction of Jerusalem. Those who watched for the sign of the coming ruin and fled from the city escaped the destruction. So now we are given the warning of Christ's second coming and of the destruction to fall upon the world. Those who heed the warning will be saved. So basically the signs are here for us to see, okay, now we are near. Now we have been warned, now we can prepare ourselves for this. This is how the people the, uh, got saved out of the destruction in, 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 of Jerusalem. Because when Christ, uh, when, when in Matthew 12, chapter 24, he, has two, he answered two questions from the disciple. 
disciples when he was uh, when it was going to come again the signs for his coming but also regarding the destruction of Jerusalem so looking back at the, at the destruction of Jerusalem there were no time prophecy reaching there but they had the signs and again from the same chapter we have the same signs for his second coming there's no time prophecy but we have the signs and this is what the prophet says you know those who heed the warning will be saved those who watch for the sign so this is what uh, what it will mean for us too in, in the end we need to watch for the signs this is why they are there this is why we have them if there would be time the time prophecy wouldn't have the signs we wouldn't, wouldn't need a sign signs if god would have revealed it to his people in the end now the last principle i want to bring up is new light never contradicts established truth um, since the church was established uh, the, the, the pioneers were establishing pillars of the faith. They were establishing doctrines. And uh, Spirit of Prophecy, you can study it for yourself in Testimonies of Volume 5. I will only read the beginning of it. But she says this from page 292. She says, God has not passed his people by and chosen one solitary man here and another there as the only ones worthy to be entrusted with his truth. He does not give one man new light contrary to the established the established faith of the body so the established faith of the body uh, we need to look, take a look at what was it when she wrote this and she says new light will not be contrary to it okay in the fundamental beliefs in 1872 at this time uh, it says this in the introduction as seventh-day Adventists, we desire simply that our position shall be understood and we are the more solicitous for this because there are many who call themselves Adventists who hold views which we can have no sympathy uh, some of which we think are subversive of the plainest and most important principles set forth in the Word of God. So the reason why they established doctrines was because there were people calling themselves Adventists coming with crazy ideas that went, went against simple truth from the Word of God, the plainest it says, and then they will list some examples of these plain teachings that they that they hold. It says, as compared with other Adventists, Seventh Day Adventists differ from one class in believing in the unconscious state of the dead and the final destruction of the unrepentant wicked. Another in believing in the perpetuity of the law of God, and so on. Talking, and then they saying, and in setting no time for the advent to occur. From all in the observance of his of seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and in many applications of the prophetic scriptures, with these remarks we ask the attention of the reader to the following propositions, which aim to be a concise statement of the more prominent features of our faith. So, with this in background, uh, we can all, we can also go to the eighteen. 89 revised uh, fundamental beliefs and in the beginning there it says the following propositions may be taken as a summary of the principal features of their religious faith upon there is so far as we know entire anonymity throughout the body this simply means that you know the, the members of the body the members of the church were not opposing this i mean it is a general agreement and in fact we saw that ellen white certainly agreed with it and also here if she would disagree they would not have been writing something like this. I mean, the prophet of God, if, if she would disagree with it. Um, but she has been plain, as we have seen already in statements. Now, to the fundamental belief, number nine, it says, and it's the same in both versions, by the way, that the mistake of Adventists in 1844 pertained to the nature of the event, then to transpire, not to the time, that no prophetic period is given to reach to the second advent, but that the longest one, the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, terminated in 80.44 and brought us to an event called the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, no, prof no prophetic period is given to reach the second advent. This is what's the established faith of the body. And she says new light will not contradict it. In 1888, she affirmed this belief by saying, Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to, the, to intervene between the close of prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. Very plain. Now, if you're still unsure, if we really believed in this earlier, as an established belief, as a pillar, uh, 
you can just look at the name. Seventh day Adventists. We are people waiting for the advent of Christ. This is how we came, to come, uh, came together. It started with a mistake regarding setting a time for Christ's coming. But this was even prophesied in scripture. So with this in mind, we cannot go against this pillar of our faith, the second coming, which is established, which is supported by the word of God and his prophets uh, to the end time. So this, these pillars of faith was established with much prayer among the pioneers, studying the word of God. And as they were studying, also God will give Ellen White visions. And in particular regarding the second coming, she says, God has been showing me this, we read earlier. So this is something that God has been showing God's prophet, who dares to go against it? It's so plain. It's impossible to misunderstand that we have once believed in this, had a firm belief in it. And also that she says, you know, future tense, we can never, we'll never be able to know. Now, she has also this interesting statement in early writings, page 96. Um, before I read this, let me read from Manuscript Releases 10, page 272. It says, we want to understand our proper relation to God. We want to know how we stand in the presence of God. I want you to see that it is not in the providence of God. That any finite man shall by any device or reckoning that he may make of figures or of symbols or of types know with any definiteness. In other words, nothing, not certain definiteness, not, you know, yeah, a certain kind. Um, but know with any definiteness in regard to the very period of the Lord's coming. And we saw that she included the years, the day, the hour. We're not to know any of this. Then what shall we know, she says. We are to study the signs which show that he is at the door. We may be waiting, but not in idle expectancy, saying, I will not plant a tree because the Lord is coming. I will not do this work in building a meeting house for the people to assemble to worship God because the Lord is coming. No, if the Lord is coming, we want to work with the more diligence to uphold and to gather the Lord's sheep and to bring them into the fold. Isn't this what Christ said? In John chapter 10, he said, There is one shepherd, and one day there shall be one fold, and I call the sheep, and they hear me, they know my voice, and they will come. He's going to gather all the sheep into one fold, into his remnant church in the end time. Friends, I want to plead with you. Instead of trying to make up new fanciful theories, as she has been warning for so plainly, you know, we cannot by making up any, like putting together figures or any symbols to know of any definiteness of his coming. Instead of doing this, we are to get ready. And we are to look at the signs and know that he's at the door. And we, are, we, need, we, have a, we have a prophetic message to reach the world with, the three angels messages. Call people out of Babylon in, in, into his remnant church. And then, why then? It saddens my heart to see that people are spending so much time to proclaim uh, that Jesus is coming in this and, and, and this year. Now, Ellen White, she says in early writings, page 96, Truth is straight, plain, clear, and stands out boldly in its own defense. But it is not so with error. It is so whining and twisting that it needs a multitude of words to explain it in its crooked form. Now, some of these theories I've been taking a look at and they are indeed so whining and twisting and using a lot of a multitude of words as it is described here. Uh, spending hours and hours and hours, many hours in video or many words to describe the, how we have the right to or how we can know the definiteness of Christ coming. And some of them, it started with, with one person wanting to know. Christ, when Christ was coming, and with this in aim, studying the Word of God. Of course, it will come up with something, but God, God's prophet says plainly, we are not to know this by, any, by putting together any kinds of figures or symbols. We're not to know of any definiteness the Lord's coming, which includes the year, the day, the hour, 
the season. The word is clear. And now as we've been looking at this, I wanted to consider uh, Winston Churchill's words that is so true. He said, you must look at the facts because they look at you. If you don't look at the facts in the face, they have a way of stabbing you in the back. Friends, are you looking at the facts? They are so plain. I've given you a few. I could have given you more. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, I will not do that now. But look at the facts, friends. Uh, it is time to take God at His word. It is time to live by thus says the Lord. Not thus says this man so eloquently. Or thus says this theory that is supported by the Bible and spirit prophecy. There are so many winds of doctrines blowing now in the church, outside the church. But we be warned regarding this so plainly. This is clear if you study it, if you look at the facts. If not, they will have a way of stabbing you in the back. Look at the facts. Are you going to take God as his word? Or are you going to try to, 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 to live by or look for something that gives you spiritual excitement? It's not time for that, friends. It's time to get excited about what is already established. The old paths. Stick to the old paths, friends. And let God guide you as you share the three endless messages. Focus on that. In Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is warning us three times, no man knows the day or the hour. In the same chapters, you know, he's saying uh, in verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Do you believe that, friends? Will you accept Jesus' plain words? Will you let he guide you? And to keep him in the center as you share the gospel to the world and focus on that and focusing to hasten his coming. Is that your desire? That is my, my wish for you. That is my, my appeal to you. Accept his plain word. Don't trust any man and, and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.